very much. With all the talk this morning about experience and innovation, I thought I'd start with one innovation that I think is particularly telling. Let me know if you've ever seen this particular innovation before. All right, you've, you've seen these devices. This is known as the Gumball Wizard from a company called Global Gumball, and it truly has revolutionized the global gumball industry. If you haven't seen one of these devices, what happens is that a, uh, a kid will come up to the device with his quarter and put the quarter in the slot and then turn the crank, and then he doesn't get a gumball, at least not right away. Instead, first he gets this gumballing experience as it goes spiraling down clickety-clack as it goes. Now, there's no functional purpose whatsoever for this device. <laughs> You don't get a better manufactured good. You know, the gumball is the same as it's always been. You don't get better service. In fact, the service is actually worse. Why? Right, it takes longer to get that gumball that you requested. And yet it has more value. It has more value because of that gumball spiraling experience. I've seen kids go up to their parents, ask them for a quarter, excitedly come up to the gumball wizard, put that quarter in the slot, turn the crank, have that gumball spiraling experience, and then pick up that gumball, throw it away, and go ask their parents for another quarter. It's, it's really just a slot machine for kids is what it is. <laughs> but why do we see innovations like this? Why is this happening? Well, it's because of a very fundamental change in the very fabric of the economy. We've gone from an agrarian economy based off of commodities through an industrial economy based off of goods, through a service economy. And what happened in the service economy is that goods became commoditized. Commoditized mean they're treated like a commodity where people don't care who makes them, they don't care about the brand, they are about the features, they're all pretty much the same anyway. They come to care about three things and three things only. Price, price, and price. That's when goods have been commoditized. And in fact, the, the internet is the greatest force of commoditization ever invented. The frictionless marketplace means that customers can instantly compare prices from one vendor to another, and it tends to push them down to the lowest possible price. But what we see now is services increasingly being commoditized as well. Long distance telephone service sold on price, price, price. Fast food restaurants with all their value pricing. And the internet can even commoditize services. If you look at financial services, what used to cost several hundred dollars to buy or sell a block of shares with a full service broker can now cost as low as three dollars with an internet based broker. What that means is that fundamentally goods and services are no longer enough. Goods and services are everywhere becoming mere commodities. And that means it's time to move to a new level of economic value, to go beyond the goods and services to staging experiences for your customers. Now, the most important thing to understand about this progression of economic value, if you remember nothing else from our time together this morning, I want you to remember this. Experiences are a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services as services are from goods. It's basically when you use goods as props and services as the stage, to engage each and every individual in an inherently personal way, and thereby create a memory, which is the hallmark of the experience. So we're shifting into an experience economy. That's where growth is going to come from in jobs and GDP now and into the future. And that is where we need to innovate. We need to innovate in experiences. This hit home for me a number of years ago when I was in Milan, Italy, giving a boardroom presentation to a number of different executives. And one of them was the vice president of Maxwell House in, in Italy. And he, he said something that floored me. He said, you know, there, there's been no innovation in the coffee industry in 15 years. And I said, are, are you kidding me? Have you never heard of Starbucks? Because <laughs> for him, innovation wasn't goods. They were manufactured. Like he had blinders on. We only innovate in goods. Totally missing the innovation in the coffee drinking experience that Howard Schultz created at Starbucks. The irony, of course, being it was actually Milan, Italy, that inspired Howard Schultz to bring back that great coffee experience that he saw there back to the United States and now increasingly export around the world. Now contrast what Maxwell House did or didn't do with Nestle and its Nespresso brand. In the face of Starbucks increasingly controlling coffee consumption around the world, Nespresso innovated. They came up with this capsule system where the, the, they say the best cafe is your cafe. Not subtext, not out there in Starbucks, but the one in your own home. And they innovated the Nespresso machine. Now, yes, this is a physical good, but they designed it in such a way that just using the Nespresso machine is an experience. And then they innovated their own experience places, the Nespresso boutiques, where you can come in, you can sit down, you can be exposed to all their products. They can make a cup of coffee just for you 
on the Nespresso machine, knowing that if they get you to experience the product before you buy it, the chances you will buy it, in fact, go up. And they didn't stop there. They innovated in services with the Nespresso Club, where they allow you to automatically replenish your particular favorite capsules delivered automatically to your home. And then it just seems a basic principle of the experience economy that when you get into staging experiences, it just doesn't hurt if George Clooney is your spokesperson. <laughs> now, if you think about coffee, is that it perfectly exemplifies this progression of economic value that I'm talking about. Because coffee at its core is what? Right? What's coffee? Right, beans, it's beans. You, you, you know it's a commodity, you can actually look up the future price of coffee in the Wall Street Journal every morning. And if you convert that from a per bush bushel to a per cup basis, you know how much coffee costs per cup when you treat it as a commodity? Two or three cents. That's how much the coffee in your cup of coffee is worth, the beans are worth. But if you take those beans, you roast them, grind them, package them, put them on a grocery store shelf like Maxwell House does, now you get five, 10, 15 cents per cup of coffee. If you actually brew it for the customer in a vending machine, a corner diner, a kiosk, a Dunkin' Donuts, or 7-Eleven somewhere, now you can get 50 cents, dollar, dollar and a half per cup of coffee. But then surround the brewing of that coffee with the ambiance and theater of a Starbucks. And now how much are you paying? Right? Three, four, five, six dollars per cup of coffee with only two or three cents worth of beans in it. Four distinct levels of value totally dependent on what business the company thinks it's in. Now, Starbucks actually doesn't hold the record for a cup of coffee. I had the opportunity a, a couple of years ago to take my wife to Venice. And there, of course, we went to the Piazza San Marco. And I bought her a cup of coffee at the Cafe Florian. And then, you know, we spent over an hour there soaking in all the sights and sounds of that most old world of Italian cities. And then I got the bill. Do you know how much a, a cup of plain old black coffee cost at the Cafe Florian? 13 and a half euros. 13 and a half euros. Was it worth it? Assolutamente. <laughs> if you create a great experience, then your customers are going to pay you commensurately for that experience. But you need to create a great experience. You need to create an amazing experience, a remarkable experience. You need to create a distinctive experience. One of the things that has happened since the... Um, uh, a publication of our book is the entire movement towards customer experience. Now, one of the things that most people mean when they say customer experience, they create a, a caucus of, of customer experience. Most people, not everybody, but most people, what do they mean? They mean let's make our interactions with customers nice and easy and convenient. And nice and easy and convenient are all well and good, but they're service characteristics. They're not the characteristics of a true distinctive experience. If you want to create a true distinctive experience, often the province of a CXO, the chief experience officer, then what you need to do is not just make things nice. I mean, nice is nice, but nice rarely rises to the level of memorable. And a true distinctive experience has to be memorable, creating that memory within people. And when we make things easy, often what we do is they make them easy on us. We routinize things, so we make the same for everybody. And that gets in the way of making things personal. Experiences are inherently personal. Where do experiences actually happen? Inside of us. It's our reaction to the events that are staged inside of us. You need to reach inside of people. You need to engage them and make that experience personal. And then convenience. Convenience is actually the antithesis of what I am talking about. Convenience means let's get in and out as quickly as possible. Let's spend as little time with the company as possible. And I'm talking about how do you get your customers to value that time that they spend with you. Right, that's key with an experience. When you think about it this way, in every one of these economic changes, there's always a gray line that you can put in there that differentiates one from another. And the key one between services and experiences is all about time. It's about time. With the service, what people are looking for is time well saved. In fact, people increasingly want services as well as goods commoditized so they can spend their hard-earned money and their harder-earned time on the experiences that they want. With experiences, what you need to do is you need to provide time well spent. Time well spent, that they value the time that they spend with you in the place that you have created. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical place. You can create an experience even over the phone line, as Zappos does, where they don't measure the average hold time their, rep their reps have, which is the, how, measuring how little time we spend with customer. They, in fact, every day celebrate the representative today who got to spend the most time with the customer over the phone. You know what their record is? 10 hours, 43 minutes. <laughs> with one break. 
that they celebrate every day. Because they recognize that's how you deliver happiness. And notice that what Tony Shea at Zappos wants to do is not just deliver happiness to customers. He wants to deliver happiness to employees as well. And that is key. If you want your employees to, create a, to stage a great experience for your customers, then you need to give them the wherewithal to be able to do that. And it starts in recruiting. And one company that does that is actually the United States Army, which created AmericasArmy.com, which is a downloadable game. You download this game, you go on a mission, you succeed on it, well, then the Army lets you download a second game. Now it's a multi-user game. Now you're getting together with other people as part of a troop. And if you succeed at that mission, well, then the Army would like to recruit you. <laughs> Over 25% of the people who now go into Army first experienced it at AmericasArmy.com at a cost one-tenth of normal advertising. And once you recruit, you need to train. Whirlpool has created, the appliance manufacturer has created the real world program uh, in uh, Michigan where they bought a house modeled after uh, MTV's real world program where you take all these people, you put them in a the house and you don't make, let them leave and you fill them all in the interactions. So here you have to stay in this house uh, during the 10 week program. They don't reimburse for any hotel expenses. You have to cook your own meals in the house using Whirlpool appliances. They don't reimburse for meal expenses. You have to do your own laundry in the house using Whirlpool appliances. They don't reimburse for any laundry expenses. And what they found is that when they train people in this way, creating a true experience out of it, that their retention rate has skyrocketed over a number of different years. They're now in their 15th year uh, with the real world program. So you, you recruit them, you train them, then you need to create a holistic experience. One that really does give your employees the wherewithal. St. Helena Hospital, for example, in California, has as the theme of experience, sowing seeds of abundance. It's about sowing seeds of abundance. That we want to give our employees, give them abundant lives. So from that abundance, they can create an abundant experience for their patients, abundant experience for the family members, an abundant experience for the entire community. They recognize how important experiences are for uh, their employees, right? That they need to create time well spent for employees. Because if you don't do that, then what's going to happen with your employees is they're just going to have time spent watching the clock. Okay? That's the difference. Now, another basic principle of the experience economy is understand that when you stage experiences, you are now competing against the world. You are competing against the world for the time, the attention, and the money of individual customers. And time is limited. We can only experience things 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to fit sleep in there sometime. And if somebody does capture my time, or I'm spending my time with some other company, what am I not doing? I'm not spending that time with you. In the same way, attention is increasingly scarce. In today's media fragmented world, it's hard to capture people's attention with normal advertising that. But if I create experience, I get people to spend their time with me, what, what am I doing? I'm giving them my attention. What am I not doing? Is I'm not giving that attention to you. And the same way, money is consumable. If I have a dollar to spend, I spend in some other company, in some other geographic area, in some other industry, what can't I do with that dollar again? I can't spend it with you, it's gone. So you need to understand a basic principle of the experience economy is that the experience is the marketing. The experience is the marketing. That the best way to generate demand for your offerings with an experience so engaging that customers can't help but spend their time with you, give you their attention, and then buy your offering as a result. So if you buy a grand piano from Steinway, it right, costs over $100,000, don't be surprised if they ask you if they can throw a concert in your own home. They ask you for the friends and neighbors you'd like to invite to that concert. The night of the concert, they have valet parking outside. They serve wine hors d'oeuvres inside. And then they hire a professional concert pianist to play your own piano in your own home. And you know that's the best that piano is ever going to sound. <laughs> is the night of that concert. And the gentleman told us about this, said that Steinway did a wonderful job. The pianist was magnificent. And after the concert, two of his friends bought pianos for their homes. And that's what I mean. The experience is the marketing. And it works for incredibly high involvement and expensive products, and it works for incredibly low involvement and inexpensive products, such as Procter & Gamble every year putting in Times Square the Charmin restroom experience. <laughs> Where you go under that awning there and you go up these escalators, we have brand ambassadors that are singing the praises of Charmin, I mean literally singing the praises of Charmin. Uh, you wait in queue for your time to use a, a restroom where they have the ultimate restroom experience, they clean it after every use. When you're in there, you have your toilet paper menu. 
You have six different varieties of toilet paper you can use. And when you're done, you can sing and dance with the Sharon mascot. You can get your picture taken on the world's largest toilet. And <laughs> the first year they did this, they had over 200,000 people expose themselves, if you pardon the expression, <laughs> to Charmin toilet paper. And sales went up 14%. 14%. And you think about Apple. I can still remember when Steve Jobs, back in 2002, announced that Apple was getting into retail, and he got lambasted in the business press. But he proved them wrong by creating not just a store, but an amazing experience. Now, obviously, it's predicated on great products. If Apple didn't have great products, well, then the experience wouldn't ma matter so much. But you combine great products with great experiences, right? That's when magic can happen. And you can see it not just with manufacturers, you can see it with uh, service companies as well. ING Direct, for example, came over to the U.S. from the Dutch marketplace with no name recognition and no branches. What they did instead is they created cafes. The ING Direct Cafe, where you walk in there and you get a very European-style bistro. You order a cup of coffee, maybe biscotti from the financial baristas, and that barista then comes and engages you in conversation about your financial needs. We're trying to get you to move your savings account over into ING accounts or refinance your mortgage with ING funds. And amazingly, it works. Every time they open up a new cafe, it generates over $200 million in new accounts for ING. Now, ING Direct was actually bought by Cap One, and thanks to that and other purchases, it's now the fifth largest bank in the country. Now, this is, this is actually a, a picture of, of my family when we went to, had the opportunity to go to Iceland last year. That's, that's me and my wife there, and my daughters, Becca and Lizzie, and then Becca's husband, Ryan. And this actually has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> but my accountant said if I showed it to you, I'd be able to write it off on my taxes. I also had the opportunity to take the family to Vegas. <laughs> and Vegas, of course, is the experience capital of the world. Everything is about Vegas as an experience. And they use marketing experiences to generate demand even for their own experiences, such as Bellagio with the fountain show that draws people all over Las Vegas, so then they come and experience Bellagio itself. But again, it doesn't have to be done just physically. You can do this virtually as well. Every one of these places is an experience hub online, just like Las Vegas is an experience hub in the real world. That's why you have companies like Blendtec that nobody had ever heard of until the CEO, Tom Dixon, started using YouTube to put on all these videos about will it blend. And if you've never seen one of these, you, you need to see one. And, and they've, had over, they've had hundreds of millions of views, and sales went up 700%. Right? And obviously, that is lightning in a bottle. You can't expect that to happen in your business. But that's what can happen if you create great marketing experiences. And whether you do that for uh, consumers, whether you do that for employees, such as marketing, recruiting experiences and that, or whether you do it for business-to-business -business customers like Blendtec, right, you can create marketing experiences that generate demand. In fact, my favorite business-to-business -business company that does this is Case Construction. Case Construction has created the Tomahawk Experience Center in the north woods of Wisconsin, where they bring customers up basically to play with the equipment. <laughs> You know, it's, it's a big sandbox, and they have rodeos and contests who can move the most amount of dirt in the shortest amount of time. And they did a study and found out a customer goes up to a, number, uh, to a, to a regular dealer of theirs. They have perhaps a 20% chance to get in their business. They bring them up to Tomahawk, and it goes up to 80%. And from 20% to 80% because the experience is the marketing. So let me simply close by saying that you can stay in the illusory safety of past practice and keep on doing the same things you've always been doing, well, then mark my words, you will be commoditized. Or you can shift up this progression of economic value to staging experiences for each one of your individual customers, and then you'll be economically rewarded. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you.